Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm, you are now live on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should like to start this meeting, members and those watching, by observing a minute's silence as a mark of respect for Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We are the first meeting since her funeral, and I think a minute's silence would be appropriate. Uh, members can stand or sit as they wish. Thank you. Carried again. Um, <laughs> thank you for attending today's meeting of the Regeneration and Development Panel. The Democratic Services Officer will now conduct a roll call to check who is present at the meeting. When she calls out your name, could you please switch your microphone on and confirm your attendance? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillor Beale, Councillor Bone. No. Councillor Bauer. Councillor Collingham. Present. Councillor Crofts. Present. Councillor Gidney. Present. Councillor Humphrey. Councillor Jones. Present. Councillor Morley. Present. We've had apologies from Councillor Manning. Councillor Diwali. Present. Councillor Whitby. Present. Councillor Middleton as portfolio holder. Yep, President. And under standing order 34 on Zoom, Councillor Rives. Uh, present, thank you. Everybody, thank you, Chair. Thank you. We also have the following officers present in the meeting, either in the room or on Zoom. We have Duncan Hall, Matthew Henry, David Oosby, Gemma Curtis, Jason Richardson. Do we welcome representatives from Norfolk County Council and the Town Deal Board? Welcome. Can I remind all that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live via YouTube. By attending this meeting, you're giving your permission to be recorded and streamed. Please keep microphones turned off until you're invited by the chair to address the panel. When addressing the panel, please state your name for the benefit of those joining the meeting remotely and speak clearly in the microphone. Please ensure that you turn your microphone off once you've finished speaking. We've had apologies for absence. And now I'd like to ask the panel, if they agree with the minutes of the previous meeting. Agree. agree. Fine, then I will sign them. Declarations of interest. Any ask members if they have any interests to declare? No, none. Urgent business, none. Members present on Zoom, we welcome Councillor Ribes. And in that regard, I am going to tell the meeting that I have had an interchange of emails um, from Councillor Ribes on the subject of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Um, I have done a, quite a bit of research, um, as I promised Councillor Rives I would do, around this issue. First of all, I would say that this is not a matter for R&D. However, it is of great public interest. And um, I think some of the issues that Councillor Rives raised is, uh, is worthy of a response. And the best way to deal with that is actually to attend the um, briefing meeting on October the 5th, I think, uh, by the, Q the um, team at the QEH. We talked about accelerated funding, 
And really, I think what that is, Councillor Rives, is capital investment funding that the QEH have received to develop the new endoscopy unit and the dedicated, I knew I wouldn't say this well, ophthalmology outpatient facility. Both investments are part of the modernising of the hospital and remain as part of the new hospital when funding is secure. I have some slides, Councillor Rives and other councillors, which I intend to forward it to you so that you are well briefed prior to the meeting on October the 5th. Uh, Chief Exec, I, I can confirm that's uh, um, an online meeting, is it? Yeah, as usual. So I hope that answers some of your questions, Councillor Rives, although I'm sure not all of them. But I do repeat, this is not a matter for R&D. Right, I'd like to now move on to the Cabinet report on the multi-user community hub, town deal business case. And I pass over to, who's going to do that? It's me, hey. Natasha Hayes, Norfolk County Council. Oh, hello. hello, Natasha, yes, of course. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, Verity is just sharing the screen um, for me now. So um, I'm Natasha Hayes. I'm Head of Communities at Norfolk County Council and I'm Strategic Lead for the Kingsland Multi-User Community Hub Project, which forms part of the Town Deal Programme. Um, the members in the room will have seen this slide deck. It has been circulated. Um, there have been some um, very slight amendments to the slides, which I will run through, um, mainly picking up administrative errors that have been highlighted. Um, and the purpose of this is to provide a summary of the five business, the five cases that form this business case. So, Verity, if you can just move on to the next slide. Um, what we'll do is we'll run through the slides and I'll try and I've tried to pick up as much of the questions that have been forwarded to me before the meeting in, in what I'll run through this afternoon. Um, so the five cases are that form the business case are the strategic, economic, financial, commercial and management case. I think the first thing to highlight before we progress into the slides is the fact that this business case, this is a summary of a much wider business case, which is 59 pages long, and there's a significant amount of detail in there. And the purpose of this business case is the justification of the project um, from a financial and need perspective in terms of, of Kings Lynn. Um, an independent audit of the business case has passed it as green in all areas and said that it really does make an excellent case um, in terms of the need and requirements um, for this project in Kings Lynn and hasn't highlighted any amendments as part of that review. So I think it is important that we highlight that it is an exceptionally good business case that has stood up the test of independent external assessment that has looked at a number of these cases over the last year or so. If we move on to the next slide, please, Verity. Um, so I'm not going to go into the full detail on all these slides because the majority of members on the, on the call will have um, already seen them. Um, but the data in terms of the need for this business, this, this project has been stressed on a number of times. Um, there are a number of um, challenges facing Kings Inn residents um, in terms of skills, attainment, health and well-being, social mobility and aspiration. And all of those things have been added together in terms of the justification um, and the development of, of this project for the people of Kings Lynn. Um, the current library falls significantly short in terms of the size that is required. Um, DCMS has statutory guidelines for a library size um, and it is around a third too small just in terms of being a library. That's before you consider all of the wider services that are provided there. And when we look at um, Experian Mosaic data, which is a segmentation tool that considers different demographic um, audiences, um, there is um, quite significant evidence that the, the certain cohorts of people who we would like to use the library and the wider facilities available are not engaging in it um, compared to what we see in, in wider Norfolk and that is, is for a variety of reasons. But Verity, I'll ask you to move on to the next slide, please. Um, so um, what's presented here is, is a theory of change and, and it really is an inputs and outputs model to, to a greater or lesser extent. But what it does is it, it really sets that context in terms of what we're trying to achieve with this project, um, targeting um, hardship and vulnerability, skills attainment, health, well-being, aspirations and social mobility and support for businesses. All things that have been picked up both in terms of the data research and public engagement and engagement with stakeholders. Um, so we want to develop that multi-user 
space, improve the perception of the town centre and increase visitors, redeveloping a key location in the in the town. Um, we want to develop those community partnerships and actually bring benefits of those wider community partnerships that we have elsewhere with organisations to Kings Lynn um, with, with the space to do so provide skills and an anchor site for adult education within the town and, and provide wider services and facilities for startups and businesses, drop-in desks, business support and guidance, um, help um, and the ability to meet and bookable meeting facilities. So the inputs into that are £7.4 million worth of town deal funding and £5 million capital investment from Norfolk County Council, which I think reinforces the commitment of the County Council to this project and the realisation that this is an incredibly important development for the people of Kings Lynn. And then really in terms of the impacts, what we're trying to, you know, aiming to achieve is transforming the landscape of the town centre, enabling people to access a much improved location, creating better sight lines within the town so that more people come and engage within the town centre, that those new community partnerships are forged, that we're able to provide skills progression for the workforce, but actually we'll also be able to provide a workforce that is able to engage much more better with the um, economic um, availability within the town, those specialist businesses that exist that are, are struggling to, to recruit at the moment and supporting businesses to be more productive, to innovate and grow, which is vitally important given some of those external factors resulting from the pandemic. So Verity, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the strategic case and, and, and delivering the change, it, it relies on two key elements. The first is the building, which is obviously really important that we get that right in terms of the building itself, how it works, how it communicates, the location and the facilities that are within it. But the second side of it, which is just as important, is that programming and partnership. So what we put on within the building why that's relevant for people, who we work with, how we select who we work with and the programming that exists within it and making sure that we start that journey now. And some of the questions that we've, we've had submitted by members really um, relating to this presentation focus on the, so what if they don't come to fruition? Um, you know, essentially opening the doors on day one and it being an empty site with a tumbleweed running through it and there's some balloons at the door. And that's what we're really keen to avoid. So there's a huge amount of work it, it, within, um, there's an activity plan within the within the business case itself um, that details the maturity of those partnerships and where we are and the work that's happened to date but also detailing that wider engagement and the development of an audience development program which focuses on on, on pop-ups events opportunities and meanwhile opportunities for people in Kingsland to engage and for those partners to engage with residents so that when we do get to a point where this is built and finished it, it, it is it's a vibrant used offer with all of those key partnerships in, in place so it will provide all those lovely state-of-the-art facilities but actually the programming that happens alongside it is just as important um, I think it's important to note as well that this building this opportunity enables us to offer the same diverse and rich offer in terms of skills and partnerships that we have elsewhere so in Great Yarmouth we're already doing about three times the amount of adult education that we we are in Kings Lynn and that is down to the space and the partnerships and the way that we we can use those facilities so it enables Kings Lynn to residents to benefit from from what is available elsewhere um, and it also offers the community a clear pathway to aspiration and success. There is something in the town that is relevant and, you know, shows people that they can just come through a door and engage with things that are going to help them in whatever their, their needs are more widely. So we can move on to the next slide, please, Verity. Um, so um, we, I think we've mentioned before a number of times that we've done quite a lot of engagement towards the end of last year uh, in terms of the needs of, of, of local people and, and key stakeholders. We had over 500 participants, but that really is the first stage in terms of that engagement. And as I've said, you know, there's a whole plan as we move through the different design phases, engaging with people with protected characteristics, making sure that we look at how the building is accessible, making sure that it's relevant for residents at every stage, um, the planning consultation process. Obviously, there's designs that have been, you know, the pictures on the previous slides are an indicative notion to help, you know, pr promote the uh, the imagination, so to speak. But actually, we haven't designed anything other than those visuals at th this point. So all of that is still to play for in terms of what we end up with. Um, but obviously, the public and, and um, the members and the town deal board will be engaged with, within that process throughout. And, and just in terms of some of the initial feedback, you know from the public that we've really taken into account at this stage is that 
Um, they wanted it to be a central location that was accessible. Um, they wanted to remove the frontage of the building because actually that blocks some of those sight lines to the what some of the really beautiful buildings that you have in the town centre. So we can create that nice communicative public realm. Um, that they want enhanced training offers and facilities for businesses and, and entrepreneurs um, and a focus on spaces for people for young people so young people really said that they wanted somewhere where they could come and meet and engage in things that were relevant to their needs as well so um, throughout this project we'll, we'll be making sure that we reflect what we're doing in, in terms of that engagement and plug that in at each stage we can move on to the next slide please so next we come to the economic case, which is actually, you know, that all of that's really nice, but does that stack up in terms of numbers? Um, so in terms of Green Book business cases, you look at monetizable benefits. And for this project, they are the well-being benefit of library users. The health benefits, obviously, reduction in serious life limiting conditions has financial implications um, in terms of statutory services. Um, lifetime economic benefit of people gaining new qualifications in terms of increased earning potential um, and, and, and things like that. The welfare impact of supporting re-entrance to the labour market, so getting people back into work has a significant economic and social benefit in the town. And the value of volunteering, so the number of hours that we can we can um, encourage people to give for free, both in terms of you know volunteering for wellbeing, but also volunteering for, for work experience. And we have about 400 volunteers across Norfolk in our libraries supporting on a day-to-day -day basis so it's a, it's a really key key thing for us to capitalize on and support um so the other thing to bear in mind is that we wanted to make sure that this this business case was calculated on achievable outcomes we didn't want to give an overly inflated um bcr there's no point in doing that we want to make sure that this is deliverable so we've we've, we've tried to be conservative in our estimates and whilst we're tripling the size of, that's available to us in terms of those spaces um we're only assuming a one-third increase on current delivery that's not because we only want to increase the things by a third but we may as well go in low and aim high in terms of what we're doing so um and you'll see on the next slide how that translates into a bcr so so we've been we've been prudent in in the way that we've approached this so if we go on to the next slide verity um, and just to note that two of these figures were the wrong way around in the presentation. So health benefits from reduction in serious and life limiting conditions and welfare impact of entrance and re-entrance labour market, although were calculated correctly and in the business case are detailed in the table were the wrong way around. So we've switched those back. So they're the right in the right order. That doesn't impact the final BCR, but it, it, it was incorrect. So we've made that change. Um, so when we add all those monetizable benefits together and we divide that by by the costs and do some 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 clever things that more, more McDonald's have done for us, um, the total um, the benefit cost ratio of this project is 2.4, which demonstrates high value for money. Um, but then we want to make sure that actually we put some sensitivity testing into that. So how do we know really um, that if, if, if this project is twice as expensive or if we achieve half as much as we were aiming to, which I think are two questions that we received from members before this meeting, how do we know that this project still represents good value for money? Um, and so by um, halving the um, attainment of qualifications and, and the achievements, um, we still have a, a BCR of 1.96. And if we double the costs, we have a BCR of 1.98, both of which represent medium value for money. But in terms of the government's town deal analysis, that is still an acceptable level of value for money. So bearing in mind, we've already been pretty pessimistic in terms of our calculations to reduce those again um, and still have a viable a, a business case, um, I think, demonstrates good value for money. So if we move on to the next slide, please. And then, of course, I think it's really important to remember at this point the wider non-monetizable benefits. So you're supporting people's mental health and well-being. You're enabling them to access a range of community offers, information and signposting through those multifunctional spaces. We're creating wider land value impacts. Obviously, we're regenerating quite a significant chunk of the town centre, making it look better, more appealing. And that will drive inward investment into the town. And we're diversifying the town centre offer and delivering against those core town deal policy objectives, which is what this funding hinges on in terms of the winded town deal budget. Next slide, please. Um, the financial case obviously outlines our spending, so we'll move on to that now. 
Um, so these are the costs, the capital costs of, of the project. Um, and we've had some questions in terms of, of inflation costs. Um, we're in really uncertain territory at the moment in terms of, of inflation nationally. Obviously, there are some things happening from central government which might temper inflation, um, but we need to make sure that we plan for it. But at the same time, making sure that we don't overinflate the cost of this project to the point where they become ridiculous. So we've engaged with external cost consultants who are a national company. We've worked with on a range of other projects um, and they've costed um, this project out at REBA 1. And at REBA 1, you would be costing in significant amounts of um, contingency and risk because you're at such a, an early stage in terms of the development of the design and the project. Um, so we've put in a 24 percent allowance for inflation and contingency and risks. That is based on the guidance that we have received. Um, they, they set those benchmarks nationally. They, they, they change them um, and they are relevant for a building such as this, which is um, pretty much a complete demolition, um, re retaining the frame and it's a non-historic building. But we also do have an unknown risk items, additional contingency of 241,000. So we've tried to build in contingency on top of contingency into the project in terms of those costs we move on to the next slide please Verity. Um, and so um, again just to highlight one of the changes that has been made this slide deck um, as part of the feedback that we received from Town Deal Board um, we have actually committed to delivering this space as a community hub for a minimum of 25 years not the original 10 so that has been changed that is also represented in the upcoming Norfolk County Council Cabinet report <laughs> Um, for the 3rd of October, where the council will commit to that as well from, and from a cabinet perspective. Um, so we don't expect significant revenue generation and it will instead be funded from existing Norfolk County Council operating budgets. We have an adult education budget, we have a library budget, partners have budgets in terms of their operating costs. Um, and, and the reason for that, and which what we're trying to do is to not look at models that look at room hire and things like that for revenue generation. They're generally not sustainable and they generally don't stack up. So let, let's, put, let's, let's be realistic about how we operate this building now and, and what that looks like and, and move on budgets around accordingly um, and as a statutory service as I said the library receives a revenue grant adult learning is funded by the DFE so all of the provision that is put on within the building um, all those courses all the tutor costs all the staffing can be drawn from from that money um, and we centralize our budgets in terms of facilities management so revenue costs will be covered as part of our core FM budget some income will be generated from space hire um, and this will be reinvested into the space. But I think it's best to be prudent at this point and not over promise in terms of income, because that's not what this project is about. This project is about providing the right services that support people and having those longer term economic and social impacts on Kings Lynn and those wider benefits of those. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the operational costs as they stand at the moment. These are based on kind of what our, we, our known assumptions are and what our current budgeting looks like. Um, and also adding on some, some wider costs in terms of staffing. So we're looking at a two storey building, making sure that we have the right management and, and staffing levels. Um, I think it's important to note that this is whilst the building is going to be larger, it's not going to carry the legacy of high maintenance requirements of an older building. Um, so there's some, some efficiencies to be to be driven there. And we are incorporating significant um, energy generation measures in terms of solar arrays, blue roofs, more, more um, energy efficient heating and lighting and air cooling systems. So all of those flex up and down what our budgets look like. Um, and at all REAP stages, um, the pro as the programme progresses, those revenue costs will be reviewed. We've got a few years before we get to the point where this building's operational. So if we need to build in additional costing models and things like that, then we have time to, to, to build those. Next date. Next slide, please. Um, these are these are some of the risks. I think this is really just to demonstrate that we are considering sp specific financial risks and members would have had a chance to run through those. So I won't um, dwell on those too much at this point. Most of them are pretty obvious and, and have been raised as questions. Um, next slide, please, Verity. And then we move on to the commercial case. Um, so um, this slide just covers off the fact that we will be using our standard procurement mechanisms. Obviously, as a county council, we are responsible for um, working against our standing orders in terms of procurement. We will use a Crown Commercial Services framework um, and we're looking at doing a design and build contract, which means that we go out to open tender for a, a, a contractor and recruit the architect that way. So they work together from day one. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're looking at modern methods of construction. Um, 
to make it um, hopefully quicker to build, but also to limit disruption on site. So this is a town centre location. We, we, we want to make sure that things are kind of delivered on site and erected the same day so that we don't disturb too much the wider operations of the town centre and, and businesses that exist there. Next slide, please. Um, this is just kind of looking at the operating model again and just kind of highlighting that actually we have an existing adult learning offer, we have an existing library offer, and this is about merging those two operational models, making sure that we bring maximum benefit into the town centre by co-locating those two services, and then obviously wrapping around that partnership working in those multifunction spaces. Next slide, please. Um, and then in terms of the commercials case, I, I, I kind of focused on partnerships and programming a bit earlier, but I wanted to bring this out again um, at this point. So we are already working with um, a number of partners and they are they have um, approached us. They are actively speaking to us about the types of spaces that they would like, considering how that targets the impact. Um, and so we're working with Kawa, both in terms of creating those um, well-designed adult education pathways that make the most of our joint funding, but also building on, on, on the youth retraining pledge and, and providing permanent spaces for that. Public Health, the NHS and MIND are all in very um, um, strong discussions with us about basing outre outreach models. S similarly, Citizen Vice Bureau need to have um, a specific site in Kings Inn and, and are very focused on this being in being where that will ha happen in terms of both drop-in spaces and, and more permanent spaces too. Business support and vi advice as well, and a number of VCSE organisations. At this stage, given the amount of interest that there is in, in, in this space, and given some of the feedback that community organisations that gave to some research that the Lilly Service did into the ne needs of the VCSE sector, spaces for VCSE organisations to be able to offer their services are one of the hindrances to be able to do more within the town. So it's not about a lack of desire, it's about a lack of spaces. So opening this up will, will really help in terms of that lack of space. Next slide, please, Verity. Um, and again, this is just around that those those, those partnerships and programming um, and just saying actually elsewhere, these are all partnerships that operate within within our wider library service. Next slide, please. And then finally, the management case, which is really just considering um, the project governance, which all of you um, will be aware of, both in terms of, so we've got um, a two-stage governance process. Obviously, we, we, we come and um, provide information and updates to R&D panel, to Kings and Cabinet, but actually we are responsible because of the way this project is funded to the Town Deal Board and also Norfolk County Council's Cabinet. So there is a robust set of governance around what we are doing at every point, and that really helps to challenge what we're doing. It helps to provide the method of engagement, and it, and it focuses on monitoring and managing those risks in terms of the deliverables of this project. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the operational governance. So we are um, capitalising wherever possible on our existing structures. So we have a head of construction and facilities management and, and a director of property that uh, have managed just uh, you know, and overseen a number of large scale construction projects like this. And then working alongside um, other colleagues um, across our library service, adult education and reporting into a director. So um, throughout this, there is oversight and scrutiny as well as expertise um, about how we manage this project. Next slide, please, Verity. And then and then finally, it's really small and probably not brilliant for the screen today, but an overview of the delivery plan um, and the stars represent um, key review points um, in terms of opportunities to engage um, and, and provide oversight in terms of this project. So that is it from me in terms of the slides. If I ask Verity to shop, stop sharing her screen at that point, um, we did have a number of questions. Hopefully I have addressed a number of the concerns that have been raised, but I'm open to questions now in terms of from members from anything else that might be of interest. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, I have had some pre-submitted um, questions from Councillor Morley. Um, I think perhaps it might be appropriate if I go to you first, Councillor Morley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Natasha. Uh, your presentation answered a few of my um, concerns, but one thing that I am uh, still concerned about is you know, you're building a public amenity, which is for supporting society, and it's very much based upon uh, helping the vulnerable. I mean, we've got a big, big section on vulnerability. Uh, how, and, th and there may be a greater proportion of vulnerable, 
vulnerable people by the time this is built with inflation and et cetera over the next couple of years. One thing that concerns me is in terms of how are you going to attract the numbers of vulnerable and the people who are vulnerable to, to come to this uh, amenity space for learning, for help or whatever. You know, they may, they may not have the incentives. I mean, is there, I can't see a, a similar model in Norfolk, uh, not that I've, 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 in my research. I mean, you, the, you, you don't do it at, uh, uh, at the, um, the names just escaped me, at the library in, in the forum. Uh, you know, there is more like volunteering there and people infused to, to bring, you know, for children and for, for, for learning at a younger age. The vulnerable are a lot older than that. And uh, they're vulnerable for, for either physical, mental or other, other reasons. And I just wondered, how are you going to attract, how are you going to get people infused to use these facilities? That's, that's my concern. Yeah, and I think that some of that I attempted to answer within the, the audience development. So a key part of this is about working from, from now with residents to, you know, explain to them what it is, to get their views, to make sure that we give opportunities for them to engage in, in like I said, like pop-up events always sounds a bit a bit corny, doesn't it? But different, different things to help people see the benefit in the longer run. And I completely agree with you that it is a challenge to target older and vulnerable people. We've seen that very much with the Household Support Fund recently, trying to get people to come forward, older people for support. And we've had to spend a significant amount of effort in terms of our communications. But really the best way to do that is through those partnerships so it's really important that we work with those partners with organizations like age uk with citizens advice with local vcse organizations lunch clubs community groups to to explain what the offer is and to help them to understand how they should be supporting their the people that they work with to use the premises because it's that trusted relationship that makes people a nurture nurture that desire to take part in the, in the wider offer. And that's one of going to be one of the key areas of focus for us. Does that answer your question, Councillor? It gives me an explanation of what, what your objectives and how you're going to try to achieve it and to bring people in. Let's go, if we flip it the other way, if we say you are increasingly successful, uh, and I know, I think in your presentation, you said you just assumed the third capacity or something like that. But let's just assume it is really successful. You know, is there a, a, a and there is a clamoring for this and it's free and people realize that it's uh, an opportunity for them to, to, to move on. Is there an overflow strategy? You know, is there, a, you know, oh, can you reopen the Carnegie building? Uh, I mean, what is the, uh, uh, do, you have a, do you have a route map for, for expansion? We don't have a route map for expansion at the moment because this project considers this particular building and the capacity within that. And I think it's important to bear in mind that we're not, the plan is not to close the Carnegie. The plan is to have, to, to enable the community to use it for community usage. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking at next spring is actually what, what how we enable that to happen in a sustainable way. So actually you're gonna have a number of complementary things happening in, in within, the, within the town, including whatever may be happening in the Carnegie but I completely take on board what you're saying in terms of the the, the wonderful Nirvana position that to be in that we might end up with too much demand for, for what we're developing here and the considerations and I think as we move through the the project delivery if it starts looking as though we are not going to have enough space then we'll start building those contingencies in at that point. Thank you Natasha can I call on Councillor Humphrey? Oh, yes yeah, thank you Chairman. Um, Natasha, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you say you've got a similar centre in, in Yarmouth, which um, must inform the development of this centre. So what can you say about the experience that you've gained from the Yarmouth centre and how does it influence the confidence in the planning of this centre? So Great Yarmouth Libraries is in the middle of Middlegate estate at the moment. So it's just outside the town centre and it is a, a purpose built 1960s building um, and it has a number of floors and spaces. But um, the main thing that we've learned from that is the way that 
working in partnership encourages people to come forward. So um, Citizens Advice Bureau have, have a fixed desk there where they're able to offer advice and support and have, have rooms that they can go and, and, and kind of have private meetings with people. Um, and then working with those um, with organisations within Great Yarmouth in the voluntary sector, encouraging people to come forward means that we, we've seen significantly higher demand for our ed adult education programmes, whether that is skills based formal skills and qualifications or community based programs like um for health and well-being taking part in arts and crafts family learning and things like that as part of great yarmouth town deal there is the implementation of the library and learning center so that involves moving moving the current library into the town centre, into into another derelict retail site, very similar to what we're doing here, um, and co-locating the library and adult learning, and also um, hosting East Coast College and the University of Suffolk upstairs. So we're following two very similar models of operation here in terms of putting our resources into the town centre and trying to increase usage. So hopefully all of that experience is being plugged in into what we're developing here for Kings Lynn. Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Hello, Natasha. Um, I might have missed a few things. Do you, what do you see the population of this building being when it's at full capacity? How many people or bodies will be in the building, do you expect? That's not a calculation that we have made, but the current library has a, a square metre of 670 square metres. And this library is over 1,500 square metres. I think it's slightly more than that. So we're looking at doubling the capacity, um, at least, of what we have at the moment. So if that gives you an idea. But in, it, we, we can't, I can't really define the number of people that will be in there until the designs are at a more progressed stage in terms of the, the, the floor plan itself um, at the design stage that we can have that fire risk assessment that will tell us exactly how many people will be able to be in there. Yeah, it's good as long as they... Um have the means to park etc so that's a calculation on its own i think the other yes. thing is i hear from the provinces that um the mobile library service is being cut back some of the parish councils that have it facilities or are encouraged to take up it facilities will the hub have a facility for instance to broadcast um events or edu education classes to elderly people or young people who after school might like to do something and could do it at the parish council. There's something we're looking at in one of the parish councils I'm involved with is doing a sort of mini um, hub and it would be nice to connect to the Kings Lynn hub um, if that ever came to pass. Can yeah, ab absolutely. So whilst the learner, and there was another question uh, on this from another member um, around the spaces, not just being virtual spaces. So. Um, we're and and we're in the same in Great Yarmouth. We're we're planning on having video conferencing um, facilities in in those rooms, in some of them, not all of them, which would enable you to either a beam a course from if it's happening in Norwich to Kings Lynn and enabling people to get together in a space to do that course, or as you say, actually having having that taught in 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 the multi user hub and then beaming that out to, to online learners as well, so that everybody can benefit. I think it's one of the huge successes and good things that has come out of the pandemic that actually it makes learning more accessible to those that are able to take part in it that they can benefit from that digitally uh, as you say so that the technology will be there to be able to do it could could they for instance people um at the parishes order books um uh from some sort of it system and then the the books be dropped off at the parish um council offices or um, parish council village halls etc yeah, I think that that's one of the um, considerations that will need to come out of the mobile library consultation in terms of how how we 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 do that in in the future. I think that has been a suggestion that has been brought forwards um, for that is actually about those kind of the book deliveries for the future. And you could do that with Kinder, say, for for people that could read it and get Kinder book through the library service. Yeah. Yeah, so you can already use, um, there's an um, um, Libby app, which is an app that you can download onto your e-reader. So you, and that's actually free in Norfolk already. So you can use that to access um, e-books. The NCC presence, I, you're having a project manager, number one, a one project manager. Will that person be able to answer um, questions and help people in the community with things to do with such diverse um, aspects as perhaps educational courses? elsewhere in the county or even um, waste issues and that sort of thing um, rather than ringing the um, 
the, the generic number which NCC has to redirect you, which sometimes doesn't always help you. It's sometimes nice for a lot of people to actually speak to somebody and then that person can direct them as to how their query can be uh, answered. Well, is that the one of the duties of that person in the yes. room? It will be. Yes. It'll be very so, busy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so a lot of the role is around information, and, that, and this is a role of a library assistant already in in Norfolk. Is about that information and signposting, um, enabling people to get access to to support, supporting digital inclusion. Obviously, that is a, a big issue in a rural county. So that that that, that multi skilling of those staff members to be able to provide that support is imperative and already part of that model. That's a very good point. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any more comments? Oh, Councillor de Wally. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, thank you, Natasha, for the presentation. Um, yeah, I think quite a lot of my questions have been answered. Uh, with regard to um, the initial surveying, uh, can you give us um, or, or give me some uh, assurance that, um, that work was done to evaluate um, uh, um, its reman remaining practical life lifespan and uh, what the ongoing maintenance, maintenance requirements were before actually going for such a, um, a, a radical rebuild. Um, the, bear with me, um, let's just get rid of ones that have been answered. Um, yes, where is the multi-use uh, concept may be an effective use of physical and human resources is the mix of activities and clientele truly compatible um, and especially with vulnerable users and just again touching on the mobile library service um, it requires was it just over four hundred thousand pounds per annum um, it's very frustrating to see so much money being spent on one building uh, when we are planning to cut a very highly efficient mobile library service which covers in excess of 1300 stops by uh, just £200,000 per annum, but that's half its budget. Uh, I, I find, it, you know, why are we not able to find that little bit of extra money for the mobile library service, given it gives such good value? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in, in terms of the surveys and, and the reasons for the approach to, to build, the architect at stage one, um, before we even got stage one, actually, we commissioned a range of different surveys and feasibility studies um, into the building that included core drilling of the concrete, analysis of the steel frame and a range of other things and asbestos surveys. And the reason that we did that is obviously we're committing public money to the, 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 the design and the build of this building. And we needed to be confident that actually purchasing that site was, was feasible with in the financial envelope that we, 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 we thought we had um, and obviously with concerns around concrete given other buildings in the surrounding area having issues of similar things so we 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 the, the proposal to demolish um, but it, retain the frame um, was the most economic approach to doing the design. Um, the architect advised that if they were to rebuild the building and having demolished it, they would rebuild a very similar frame given the size and footprint of the building. So actually it's it's the most um, ecologically um, carbon neutral way of doing it so to speak plus actually you're, there's no point in demolishing something that you would rebuild again um in terms of the wider demolition um the the the, the building you know we've had a lot of significant feedback from members actually that they we don't want to just have to look like a, a reclad argos building so you you need to strike a balance in terms of the the availability of the site making sure the massing is correct in terms of the design but also thinking about the carbon impact of the building so so the approach that has been developed is a, as a result of the reba stage one design process and those those feasibility in, and um, surveys that we've done um in terms of vulnerable users i completely agree with you one of the things that we need to make sure is all the way through this we need to engage with the public with those vulnerable users to understand their needs and requirements and, and to engage with organizations that support them as well because they are often you know seldom heard in terms of their opinions and and, and things like that and their wants and needs so that engagement approach all the way through the design process and given that we are only at reba stage one is absolutely Im Im imperative in terms of designing a, a building and an offer that meets the needs of the people that we want to engage with it so that is built into the project all the way through 
Um, in terms of the mobile library service, there, there has been an active consultation. Um, I can't provide feedback here about the availability of council budgets in terms of library service because that's not what I've been um, asked to do this afternoon. But I'm hoping that you will have provided your feedback into, into that consultation on the mo mobile library service. I understand the consultation closed yesterday. Thank you. Uh, and yes, I have. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what will the building be worth when it's completed? I don't have a valuation for the building at this stage. Um, I've been asked a similar question previously by the Town Deal Board. Um, we're developing an asset for a specific purpose. So whilst the land it sits on has value, in terms of a residual value for the building in the future, it's very difficult to say because you'd have to, and very similar to the Argos building at the moment that was built for that specific purpose, its value when you consider the location and the size of the building is not significant, but that's because it's built for a specific reason. So we're building building a purpose-built community hub that we would commit to delivering for 25 years and, and the value of that is in terms of it being a community asset. I don't have a, a commercial value for the building at this point. You must have an anticipated value though. <laughs> there is no plan to sell it so we don't need to have a valuation at this stage. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crofts. That, thank you, Councillor Collingham. Thank you. Natasha, I would like to ask a question about the meetings that, and the, some, some of these uh, rooms you can hire out. There'll be some organisations that don't want to use it during the day, they want to use it evenings. Mm -hmm. And what have you got to accommodate staff wise? And then what, is that going to be okay? Because lots of organisations do meet in the evening and you've got the facilities there. Have you got anything in hand to accommodate those people? Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, we've got open libraries at the moment. So our facilities are open for extended periods um, for those with, with library cards. And we're exploring various different options, of course, staffing to make sure that it's safe and that it's managed and it's locked up. Um, but also thinking about if you make a booking, how can you gain access to certain rooms with a QR code? Obviously, those types of things are widely used um, in, in other areas like hotels and things like that. So technology offers us a range of options to make those facilities um, sustainable in terms of of operating them we have to think about the staffing as I say in terms of keeping people safe but we want these facilities to be open as much as possible and as you say evenings and weekends are where people who who work want to be able to access them so we're, we're used to operating in an environment such as that especially in terms of adult education we like to keep um, anti-social hours so it's something that we'll be building into the operating model thank you thank you thank you very much councillors um I have um a recommendation. We are asked to consider the report and make appropriate recommendations to, cab to Cabinet or support the recommendations as set out below. Are you ready? One, endorse the draft business case as set out in Appendix 1. Do I have your broad agreement? Okay. Two, delegated authority is granted to the Chief Executive the deputy leader and the portfolio holder for development and regeneration to approve the final business case in their capacity as representatives of the council on the town deal board. Do you have your agreement to that? Great. Delegated authority is granted to the section 151 officer to approve the final business case and to sign the business case summary document for submission to government in the council's capacity as accountable body for the town deal. Do I have your agreement? Thank you. Approve the transfer of the relevant freehold land to Norfolk County Council on the terms set within this report to facilitate the delivery of the multi-user community hub. Do I have your agreement? Agree. Delegated authority to the Assistant Director for Legal Services and Licensing to make and complete all necessary documents in relation to the proposed transfer of the Borough Council freehold land interest referred to within this report. Do I have your agreement? Agreed. Thank you. Doing. I'd now like to move on to item nine, which is the active and clean connectivity business case. Okay, I know we need the door open. And I can feel it coming. So I'm I'm sorry, councillors. I'm just asking to close the window because it's 
blowing a breeze down my neck. So uh, maybe we can open another one. Thank you. Right, David, on, on to you now. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, we have a presentation, which uh, Rebecca, will you be able to put it up for me, please? Which was uh, prepared by my colleagues last week. I was on leave last week, so uh, apologies if it's um, a little clunky, but I think you find it will be a little shorter than the previous presentation. Okay, um, if we could move to the next slide, please. There we are, the vision. Um, this is the, the third time that we've um, brought the African Clean Connectivity Programme to R&D, and I hope you'll find that um, there has been some iterations throughout that process, but the vision has remained the same, a sustainably connected town with safer walking and cycling routes. Could we move to the next slide, please? The strategic case, and on to the next slide. Um, the case for change, uh, for growth and connectivity, clean and safe travel into town, and a cleaner, greener town, uh, form the basis of the strategic case. Um, that is dealt with in greater detail within the business plan, um, but that is uh, the best summary that we have, really, of what the strategic case is. Um, the, uh, the next slide, please. The investments are into three key areas. The, the first is the local cycling, walking and infrastructure plan. And on this slide here, you'll see a map showing the, um, the Kings Lynn LC Whip area. Um, I also have a, an additional slide later, which I can produce um, if requested, showing on that map where these interventions are, which are listed on this slide which are at Rethley Road, Fairstead Cycleway, Old Meadow Road, Fairstead Improvements, Bishop's Road to Gaywood Hill Drive, Gayton Road, Toucan Crossing, Low Road Hall Lane, Toucan Crossing, uh, Tennyson Avenue Crossing Point, that's probably the most important um, of all of them. Low Road, Wooden Road to Toucan Crossing, Edward Benefer Way, Cycle Lane Connection to say the Edmondsbury Way, also on Edmund Benefer Way, the junction with Bergen Way and uh, Toucan Crossing. And at the Hardwick Round out in St. Valerie Rain, um, cycle, chicane, barriers, review, and improvements. All of these are aimed to uh, improve the connectivity uh, through what is already um, um, quite a substantial network of walking and cycling routes within the town, which suffer from barriers which are created by where these pathways have to cross other highways or other physical features. We could move on to the next slide, please, on the uh, Nauru's Enterprise Zone, uh, the active travel hub. There are two travel hubs uh, proposed within the town. The one on the Nauru's Enterprise Zone um, was the initial one that we brought to you. And uh, at that time, uh, there were many people saying, why are we doing this here? There's nothing on the site. Uh, what's the benefit? Isn't it just a car park on the outside of town? Um, we have developed that to include uh, an additional travel hub now within Baker Lane, but to deal with this one first, this is to deal with the, the growth of the enterprise zone, um, which at the moment only includes a few uh, business units, but that will be a 15 hectare site and will, will be full of offices and light industrial space, and there will be uh, an increasing demand for people to travel to and from there, and the hub will enable active travel and uh, a multimodal change. So you'll be able to change from one form of transport to another, from walking to being able to get a bus, um, from driving there by car to hiring a bicycle, uh, because the hub could also form the basis as one of the hubs for a, a, a cycle hire network within the town. So it is ambitious and uh, forward looking, um, but you may also remember that previously we, we, we discussed our commitment to active travel and that by making bold choices, things are more likely to change. Um, by, being, um, by being not bold enough, um, that things are most likely to get worse and uh, that would actually be a waste of money. So this active travel hub on the Nauru's would be an investment for the future and would ensure that we have the active and clean connectivity option available. We move to the next slide, please. Um, the, the next slide is uh, an active travel hub, which is on the same model. It's a modular format that we have. 
um, for the Nauru's Enterprise Zone. Like the Nauru's Enterprise Zone, this would have uh, uh, secure cycle storing for at least 48 cycles within the units, as well as additional space for accessible bikes and longer bikes, um, charging points as well for people to be able to recharge um, the electric bikes. Um, provision for scooter racks and also for lockers for people that may want to change um, from their cycling wear into their, you know, into their work wear. This would be located within the Baker Lane car park immediately behind the existing toilets which are there. Um, the um, location would enable people who work within the town, particularly within the shops, within the high street area within the town, to be able to cycle into work and have somewhere secure to park their bike where they may not be able to do that within their existing employment because many of the shops and offices don't have space where people can secure their bikes. And many bikes these days, particularly the EV bikes, are becoming more and more expensive and therefore desirable for thieves. And the feedback we've received from many people is that they would cycle in um, if they had somewhere secure where they could put their bike and they would also like to be able to change there as well. We'll also explore the possibility of um, uh, extending the change in facilities to have sharing facilities, potentially within the Baker Lane uh, toilet area as well. We could move on to the next slide, please. The third area of investment is the active travel plans. Um, we have already engaged um, with Mobility Ways, uh, formerly known as a charity called Lift Share, who previously worked with over 700 employers mm -hmm. Uh, and who have saved over a million miles, I think, or probably even a billion miles of excess journeys that people have been uh, made by car. They um, have been um, recognized by the Department of Transport as um, the leading provider with unique software to allow employers to analyze their, uh, their staff travel to work, their commute pattern, so that they can better understand how people are traveling to work and what the options are for them, uh, what the alternatives option for, for them instead of just having to drive into work. Um, we already have Green Yard, Frozen Foods, Mars and the NHS on board. And we have three other organisations, which I won't name yet until we have uh, their letters of support with us, um, who we believe will come on board and that will make the six employers. The, um, the, the council as well is also engaged with Mobility Ways to undertake its own active travel plan through separate funding outside of the, uh, the town's fund. That was funding that was already made available by the Department of Transport for Norfolk County Council. Um, together, we can aggregate the data and get a much better picture of what the commuting patterns are in the morning. Um, and the reason that's important is the commuting is the, 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 the worst time of the day for pollution, for congestion for CO2 and that's where we can make the biggest impact if we can understand that pattern of what's happening and what we can do to change to encourage people to use the bus more, to lift share more, to walk or to be able to cycle and how employers would be able to enable that. We could move on to the next slide please. Underpinning all of that um, will be uh, a communications and behavioural change strategy this will be a comprehensive marketing and engagement plan to influence, create and maintain positive behaviour habits over the longer term. Uh, the next slide, please. The, output, the outputs and the outcomes. Um, the total length of new cycleways is three and a half kilometres of new cycleways. That doesn't include the total length of cycleways which were improved as a result of the interventions in the LC, which is much, much wider. But for the purposes of calculating the benefit cost ratio for the scheme, we can only include the actual new pieces of new cycleway, which are there. Uh, similarly, that's 5.6 kilometers of pedestrian paths, which are improved. Uh, at least six alternative fuel charging refueling points, that's EV charging points, they'll be located at the travel hubs. Up to 50 new out of town car parking spaces will be provided at the Nauru's uh, active travel hub. The 48 cycle parking spaces is actually a lot more than that. It would be two times the 48 car parking, uh, cycle parking spaces plus the additional cycle spaces within the two active travel hubs and the two transport nodes with new multimodal connection points. And the outcomes are improved affordability, convenience, reliability and sustainability of travel options to and from places of work and places of interest and a reduction of congestion within the town. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, the economic case. 
Um, the approach to the economic case is a combination of quantitative and qualitative analysis designed to um, um, assess the, the impact of the scheme using the Department of Transport Active Mode Appraisal Toolkit, otherwise known as AMAT. The net result is it's producing a, a BCR of 3.44, which represents very high value for money. Um, this is because the, um, the small um, cost of in, the improvements that we can make through, through active travel have significant benefits, um, not just in health, but in convenience and appeal and the quality of environment, health, well-being, and safety for, for everyone concerned. We can move to the next slide, please, the commercial case. Um, in terms of the procurement, uh, there are three areas of procurement. The, um, the active travel hub and the Baker Lane active travel hub that will be uh, procured and delivered through the council's uh, corporate projects team, which uh, sits within uh, my directorate area. Um, my directorate, as you know, is responsible for the major housing project and also other commercial projects. And, uh, overall, we're managing a, a capital program of over 100 million pounds. The, the LC WIP will be uh, delivered by Norfolk County Council uh, through a funding agreement, similar to the funding agreement that we'll be using for them to deliver the multi-user community hub. Um, the, the way that works will actually be delivered will be through their existing capital program of, uh, of works where Tarmac is their main contractor. And um, all of these projects are fairly day-to-day uh, -day kind of projects for the council uh, to be able to deliver. Um, but um, we will have a, a program and a set of key performance indicators that we will require the council to work to, to ensure that the projects are delivered and they are delivered on time and to the budgets. And the active travel plans uh, will be through a direct award via an exemption to mobility ways. Um, as I demonstrated, we already have mobility ways on board and um, they already working with us to uh, achieve that aim. We move to the next slide, please. On terms of the management case, the management case reflects the local assurance framework, um, uh, which um, is the, the, the key, key part of all of the projects within uh, the town's field board. So we're accountable ultimately to the town's board, um, but by the, um, uh, the, the cabinet and these kind of meetings as well. Um, the project sponsor is myself, and I'm assisted by my principal project manager, James Grant, and uh, um, Jason Richardson, as well within the regeneration and development team, and Ian Parks in the Norfolk County Council will be coordinating the works with Norfolk County Council. Um, we will continue our engagement with major stakeholders, including K.O. Bug, education providers and business representatives, and um, within our project board, um, we have uh, a member of the Town Deal Board, Brendan Grove, and we also have uh, councillors from Norfolk County Council, Councillor Daubney, and uh, from the Cabinet of uh, the Borough Council, uh, Councillor uh, Sandell. Um, the next slide, um, it's probably a little bit difficult to read, but it shows you the programme milestones for the LC WIP, the Active Travel Hub, and the Active Travel Plans. Um, shown when the schemes are uh, intended to be delivered. The, the next slide is uh, a summary of the risk management. The, the main risk areas are uh, the economic and cost inflation um, issues, which have uh, been setting many projects. Um, but in terms of um, the resourcing for the projects, we are satisfied that we have all the resources um, available for us to be able to continue with the case. And uh, the final slide is um, any questions. And um, Rebecca, if you could just put up that, that additional image that we have of the OC whip, please. Just so that we can share everyone there. Um, so we've got, we've got you, we've got Ben. Councillors, could I have a show of hands to say who wish to ask questions so I can, so Ben, yeah, Chris, and Chris, I see. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Great. Lovely. Um, so in no particular order, I'm going to start with Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, myself and Councillor Knockholds uh, emailed Norfolk County Council about the proposed route through North Lynn. 
uh, where you're taking people from the path along the Borsy Drain and then turning them off through St Edmunds at Bree Road up back onto the Edward Benefer Way. We've suggested that you'd be better off staying on St Edmunds Bree Road all the way round. There's a small part where it's very narrow which could be wide, widened easily because it's just shrubbery just on the side. Why is this still not being looked at? That's not being, sorry, um, I'm still on, yes, <laughs> just making sure everyone can hear. It's not being addressed within this town's fund programme of LC Web projects, but that is identified within the wider LC Web strategy. And it is linked to the, um, the levelling up bit uh, for the gyratory. And, and the south gates because when when the gyratory scheme was was within the active travel um, program we were very concerned about how the uh, the cyclists coming down from edward benefit way and the borsy drain how they were actually going to get to the bus station and the train station because that's that's the purpose of that green route now there's a, um it's the gyrator has been taken out it's more likely to be addressed through the levelling up bit, but it's still there within the strategy. But it's more of a medium term and not an immediate term. The, the projects that we have within the LC RIP are ones which the County Council colleagues feel would have the biggest, most immediate impact within the funding envelope that we have available for the Towns Fund. We had to take some projects out, such as the bridge over the sand line, because of the uncertainty over the cost, of, but also about being able to deliver it within the funding envelope but it's still definitely there on the radar. And you're right. I mean, it's a very important route coming in from North Lynn down Edward Benefit Way. And that is an area that you know, really does need But what attention. you're doing is you're taking people from a proper cycle path, which runs along Ballsey Drain, asking them to turn off and go right through a residential area where children play out in the street, um, could be running from behind a car, Whereas if you either keep them on the cycle path, they're less likely to encounter children playing. And also it's better street lit along Edward Benefer Way than it is going through um, St. Ed's. Yeah, just to reiterate, when we had the gyratory project in, we, um, the, the view was that the yes, the cyclists would come off the Borsey Drain, then on to Edward Benefer Way, John Kennedy Road, and then you'd be at the top end of the gyratory and there would be a cycle lane, a dedicated cycle lane from down railway road that would allow you then to either go to the bus station or the, or the train station. So you wouldn't have that having to come off and go into the residential areas. You would be straight on the main road. The, the problem is that John Kennedy Road, the width of the road there at the top, doesn't really give you enough width for a dedicated lane for the cyclists at what is a very busy junction. So you have to create a, an additional phase on the signals to be able to have that, that safe manoeuvre through for the, for the cyclists to be able to come through. But that will be taken up with the gyratory project, which is part of the levelling up bid, and is not now within the town's fund business case. Somewhat so unsatisfactory response. Chris, Councillor Crofts. Thank you very much. You mentioned, um, I talk about cyclists again, you mentioned about the safe storage, the, the facility you, you plan to and you also mentioned 50 for a start, then it would be nearly 100. This is going to be a, a costly exercise to produce all these. Will there be a chargeable um, fee for the use of these facilities? Yes, we've discussed this with um, our operations team who manage our car parks and uh, open spaces. We feel um, it would be best to have a, a chargeable system, but just a nominal charge. And that's to have a card entry system. So, you know, people have to be members and they have a card. And then we can control who is entering these storage facilities. We'll also have comprehensive CCTV coverage of the area um, for anyone who's concerned about their safety and entering these areas. And there's also um, within the design uh, emergency exits for people that may feel uh, that they're trapped within these spaces so they could, they could easily get out. And that's all integral within the design. But yes, part of that is a, is a kind of a membership scheme um, to, uh, to control the, the people that use the areas so that we know who they are. So you've thought about this, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Dan. I'm uh, trying to look at this through the eyes of the adjudicator. And 
and you decided to attempt the ratio increase of 44. Uh, but you haven't got a pro an argument yet, have you? Yeah, you, you've got three companies signed up to uh, to examine their own workforce. You've got some in the pipeline. You've got the company who's going to, who's going to see how many people are going to put this capacity that there is, how many people are going to be using it, how many efficiencies are going to be. go down and work with people who want to do work home three days a week, maybe you can take cars in for one day. Uh, we got children and the other days we are doing lots of shopping. So I don't think that there's a, 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 a case yet. I mean, one suggested by a benefit from a and two, for the building of expensive adults to car park. I, I, I think that they, that you would normally do is a, a demand exercise first. That there is a demand. Now we, this is the outcome that we want. This is how we're going to satisfy it. This is how the benefit is uh, to everybody. But we haven't done that yet. But I just don't, don't think people might think it's a good case. I don't think it's a case at all, personally. And I, and I just don't have any good idea that we have. It's, it's, it's sort of, I don't think it's that good. I'm not convinced about the car parking at that one. I'm not convinced about people going into change and then moving on again. And I, and I don't see any evidence that. That there is a demand for that, and you you sort it, and so therefore, in terms of risk management, you put everything in the green virtually, and, and I think it's it's rare until it's until it's demand is broken. So I, for one, think that it should that there should be more work done mm -hmm. on the demand side before this before this can go forward. Now the treasury might say, well, we waited long enough, we'll give you the money, but there again, they might not. They might say, well, this is a bit, you know. This is a bit of a spurious argument here. If I was a city treasury, I would have signed it up. So I think, Chair, from my point of view, I think this one should be stored for the time being until uh, mobility, whatever, yes. uh, mobility ways have done some more work on it. How many companies have signed up? Now, I, I don't want to delay this. You know, it's, been, it's, been, you know, it's been peddled around for long enough. But I, I don't think we've got far enough on it but on key aspects. And so I, I don't forget that. I don't know if it's my, 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 my son is cut off on purpose. But uh, uh, <laughs> so I, for one, uh, I can't support this in its current guise, Chair. Sorry about that. Was that? I hope that I hope those objections of mine actually did reach you uh, without the. Uh, <laughs> Good. I would say that this has been kicking around for an awfully long time. And if I understand the presentation right, it is up to us to present it as an opportunity for people. If we wait for people to uh, offer a prima facie case for taking it up, we could wait an awfully long time. And um, I, I, I am of the view, and it is just a personal view, that it's absolutely vital that we get people uh, out of their cars onto bicycles. I would like to see more, I'm, I'm sorry, councillors, I'm slightly hogging, but I would like to see more integration with the bus system. I'm not hearing enough about that. And I've said that so many times, but I think we need large hubs where people abandon their cars, pick up a bicycle or get on a bus. And uh, as for establishing, as I said, a prima facie case, I don't think you'll ever do that. I think you've got to say, here it is guys. It's going to cost you a shed load of money to drive in Kings Lynn. And here's a much better opportunity. And that's what they've done in major towns with congestion charging and other schemes. And I think that's one of the things we're going to uh, have to do, isn't it? It's carrot and stick. But um, welcome your views, Councillor Morley. Councillor Diwali, I have you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for the report. Um, I have two questions. Uh, are you confident that Active Travel England, who I understand have oversight of this bid, and please correct me if I'm wrong, will be convinced that a significant proportion of the bid uh, put over to motorised transport is compatible with the clean and active transport concept, given that this bid proposes to create 50 car parking spaces compared to 98, sorry, 96 bicycle parking slots? along with only a very short increase in new cycleways and some improvements to footpaths. Uh, my second question is regarding the black dotted line. 
um, which is, I believe, labelled West Winch Future Corridor. Now, West Winch um, is part of the town fund area and will be um, burdened with a lion's share of development. I believe some 6,000 homes are uh, envisaged. So can you um, provide assurances that this will actually happen given that it's, it's not in uh, this bid? Um, and uh, unfortunately, like my uh, colleague, Councillor Morley, in its current guise, I, have, I, I can't support um, the uh, recommendation going forward. Thank you. Um, well, if I could just respond on the um, um, uh, the Act of Travel England, the uh, the the project has been designed um, with all of the guidance which has come from government today is about uh, decarbonisation of transport, creation of active travel, and um, um, you know we we are confident that um, um, these these plans and these proposals are doing this. It is bold, as I've said previously about creating active travel hubs, but that's on the back of the, the LC WIP strategy, which went through extensive consultation through Norfolk County Council and local people. And uh, Norfolk County are also bringing the knowledge and experience that they've learned in places like Norwich and Great Yarmouth um, with bike hire schemes and other interventions on active travel uh, to bear on this side. Um, so um, they're, they're not just plucked out of the air, the, the air the, these ideas are having secure hubs. I think the ONS data from 2011 was showing that 17% of all journeys into town um, were by walking or cycling, which was um, much higher than the regional average of only 11%, due in no small part to the incredibly good infrastructure that we, we do have in the town for walking and cycling, but many of us don't see it in our cars when we're driving up and down. And the, the whole purpose of the LC WIP is to connect up these, these really good routes of great routes out to the hospital that many people wouldn't know are there, which are so quiet and so placid and so calm that being able to connect people into those would have a transformational effect on, on so many people. So uh, we do feel confident that um, the proposals within the project will be able to um, address um, the, um, what's set out in the vision and that that vision would be supported by Active Travel England. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. May I ask on the case of... Well, sorry. Question, yeah. yeah, I'm happy just to help with that one on, on West Winch. Um, I mean, it was it was um, discussed, and obviously you can see in, in the LC WIP, in terms of your question about assurances about its funding, it's not... Uh, it's not going to be funded through the development of up to 4,000 homes, but I think clearly strategically, um, it's a really important and valuable, potentially valuable link to the east side of the town with the high with the three high schools. So I think it's there. And um, whilst funding hasn't been identified at, at this stage, I think it should it, it it is an ambition and it should remain an ambition. And I think, you know, going back to Councillor Morley's question, I think, you know, the, the, the sort of chicken and egg question, the, the government is absolutely clear about um, funding for transport has to, has to include um, clean and active travel. And so I think this, this um, is, is an ambition, but it will, re it will remain so. And no, there's, n there's no funding identified at this stage. Thank you. Sorry, could I just, I've had several figures uh, pointed at me with uh, could I have clarification of the exact number of homes that are intended for West Winch, just to uh, confirm, just to clarify. Thank you. Four thousand. Councillor Middleton, I think you wanted to pop in there. Uh, yeah, ju just a couple of comments, um, if I may, and not to, not to steer the argument in any particular direction. I, th I think what's worth adding is, of all the town board projects, this is the one that's the bold and ambitious one. And time will tell, you know, I mean, there has been conversations with the town board. Is Kings Lynn five years too early for this sort of thing? Is there the demand there today? And I think I listened to what Councillor Morley said and his reasons for objecting against the current proposal as it stands. I think it's fair to say with such a bold and ambitious plan, which is heavily hinged around arguments that have been made around... Um, emissions down London Road and what we can do as a town to try and alleviate those and to make the town more greener in terms of our climate change ambition. I'm sure if you were to go out to the outlying villages of 
Terrington and Clench walking in one direction and, and Grimston in another direction and potentially Snettersham and Dursingham in another one and genuinely, genuinely asked people today, would you do this? They're stuck in the norm. For decades now, individuals in those villages have drove into town. They've scheduled within their morning trip that they will be stuck in traffic for 25 minutes every morning. That's the norm. I've done it. We've all done it. And, you know, and, and I'm sure those who work at the council do it every day. What this is around is making that bold, ambitious plan for what this could look like in the future. I am a strong believer that this will need strong incentivizing in terms of money and time. And I think that's what it's going to come down to, to the majority of people. I think that we need to get the plan right. I know we talk about memberships and what charges we might charge individuals. The bottom line is people will make their decisions based on the money that they might save and the time they might save. If this plan brings forward something that means you don't have to pay, let's say, £400, which it is £400 a year to park in the bowl key, but you can park the other side of the bowl key for a lot less, and instead of spending 20 minutes in your car down London Road, you spend 10 minutes on a bicycle, that will be the sort of thing that gets people involved in this plan. It is going to contain marketing. We are going to have to push it. But unless we as elected individuals are willing to make that bold and ambitious plan on behalf of our residents, then nothing will change. So it is a difficult one. And I understand the concerns that are raised in terms of is there the demand there today? And I'm sure, as I've already said, if we was to go out there and ask people whether they'd use this now, you'd probably get more no's than yeses. But unless we made that bold plan, unless we put the facilities in place that provides that service and, and put in the marketing that does create the shift change that will be required in people's minds, then we'll still be talking about emissions down London Road for another five years and another 10 years. There are towns in the country that are doing this. There are towns that have bought in park and ride schemes, which is heavily hinged around buses. And there are towns that are bringing in um, this sort of scheme, which is more around active travel. I feel this is the right move for Kings Lynn. I do wonder whether we are attacking it a bit early, but the public are thinking a lot more now than they were five years ago about being cautious around climate change, about their carbon emissions. And I think if we do something like this with this government funding, it's going to cost the council little. There might be a revenue implication going forward, but I'm sure we can find that money and we can push the council forward in terms of our green objectives. So I hope this can be supported. And let's not forget a lot of these town board, you know, town uh, fund plans are early in their design stages. There is still time to negotiate. There's still time to look in exactly what this will look like. But unless we get this out in at this time, then there's no opportunity for the money because there's a deadline to work to. I think we should continue with that deadline. I think we should get in what we've currently got. We have heard from the government that they like what we've currently got. So let's continue working along that process and, and make sure that we do have a town in the future that's fit for future purpose. Thank you. Councillor Gidney, come back to Mr. Uh, no, uh, I have Councillor Gidney. You've uh, Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Um, I'm coming at it from the other end. There's a trend, especially in the west coast of America and the east coast too, of what they call wide tired electric bikes. Have you come across this? They're, it's taking off like wildfire. These machines are like track bikes, but they're wide tires, which are about uh, 75 to 80 millimeters across. And the frame is purpose built. They have a range of about up to um, 35 miles at the moment, but it's increasing and a top speed usually of about 45 kph, which is about 30 miles an hour. Younger people are really grass taking this, it's really taking off in America. And I think the trend will come here. I think if you lived in Hunstanton, that sort of way, or out, out perhaps the Terrington's, um, one of these bikes would be a superb way to travel because they offer a different kind of ride. They've got suspension, they cover rough terrain, you can hop across curbs and all sorts of things. So there's, a, there's an issue here which you've got to look at as well, because in the future, 
If these take off over here, you're going to have some really fast moving um, electric bikes coming in, which will be great. So if it takes off, and I think it will, because I, I know people who are thinking about this of all ages, actually, um, because the cost of them are about three to five thousand pounds for a really good one, but you can get a you know respectable one for about two grand. And uh, you know, if you run it for two years, as it's been said, you know, you save a lot of money. But not only that, it's a lot of fun. So, and also, of course, it doubles up. So you're doing short journeys or just going out in the morning to get milk or whatever, you put it in a pannier and you know, go home. So it's another you know, means of transport. So if it does take off, um, and I'm sure it will, then these things are going to be valuable, number one. So there needs to be some kind of um, surveillance where they're parked and some sort of security. So whether they have, um, you know, some kind of electronic device that they can be tracked or whatever, some kind of thing. But that's looking at in the future. The other thing is um, <clears throat> insurance scheme, maybe, maybe, Kings Lane could run an insurance scheme for all the bikes that people use um, connected with the surveillance. Maintenance, hopefully somebody in Kings Lynn will pick up the idea that they could, while they're parked, they could come and do the maintenance um, while somebody's at work, that sort of thing. Um, but I think, you know, looking ahead, I do really believe, and if you want to, go on YouTube if you haven't already and look at some of these bikes and what the people are saying and the way they're developing in the States. Because they're, well, I've seen a few here, but they're bound to come and they're a different ride. It's a totally different thing from the push bikes that were, it's a lighter age range. You can have panniers on the back and all sorts of things. So I think it's got legs, but I think we've got to look to the future as well in developing it and be ready for change when this new market will probably come up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor De Wally. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was um, it was really uh, frankly, I've forgotten. I didn't know I was going to get the opportunity there. Um, it was regarding um, yes, um, I was going to say that uh, in the most recent edition of the Lynn News that there was a letter by a lady called Vicky Fairweather who pointed out very clearly that where we provided um, the infrastructure as, as such as the um, cycle and active cycling and walking routes along the old and Stanton railway, it became extremely popular. So if we provide the infrastructure, it will be used. I have no doubt of that. And we can be as bold as we like and the more bold we are, um, the, the, the better results will be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, everybody's had a good crack at this. Um, I just want to say one more time, I, am, I think this is a superb opportunity for us to future-proof uh, travel in our towns and wider afield. I really, really would like to see some link up with some sort of bus service, um, even if they're small in-town nip-around buses, because you know, while a lot of people are capable of riding on a bicycle or walking, there'll be a lot of people who will want emotionally to use this service, but simply won't won't have the the legs to do so. So I do urge you to look at that. And I, yes, David. Um, the Nauru's Travel Hub would include two bus stops yeah. um, on the Nauru's Way, uh, where the X1 bus will be able to stop. And we've spoken to the operators and they're happy to do that. Um, the future development of it um, has been designed so that you could have a, a, a go to town type minibus yeah. service that pulls in there. Uh, but at this stage, until um, there is a demand for the service, it'd be difficult. But the, the X1 bus would definitely want to stop there already. Well, I, as I think I've said before, um, overseas, I know towns where people park out of town and they jump on one of these little buzz around buses and they jump on it when they finish their shopping and they go back out. And I, I think that has got to be an integral part of this in view of the, uh, if, you, if you look at the profile of most users in our community at the moment. But anyway, uh, I, I think that's, let's see what we're asked to do. We're considering the report and make any appropriate recommendations to cabinet. Um, which we have made a few. Um, Becky, I, I think we could capture some of the thoughts, particularly Councillor Jones's thought about the, um, you'll 
have to get the detail from him. I thought that was quite interesting. My little in town bar some of the comments that Councillor Diwali made. Um, so I'm going to ask for a vote um, on endorse the draft business case as set out in Appendix 1. Who is in agreement? Who is against? So we have two against. Delegate authority is granted to the chief executive, the deputy leader and the portfolio holder for development and regeneration to approve the final business case in their capacity as representatives of the council on the town deal board. Who is in favor? Who is against? Who is? I'm not Oh, do you want to abstain? Okay, uh, uh, yeah. If we were in council, councillors, I'd be asking for a recorded vote yeah. because I think there are some people who will be really surprised at uh, some councillors who are not supporting this because I thought we were all uh, actually in favour of, of this sort of greener project, but that's your decision. Delegated authority is granted to the Section 151 officer to approve the final business case and sign the business case summary document for submission to government in the council's capacity as accountable body for the town deal. Can I have a show of hands on that, please? Against. So we have two councillors who are against, thank you. To approve the future revenue costs associated with the operation of the active travel hubs detailed in section seven to be built into the operational budgets from 23 to four. Okay, do I have a show of hands, approval? And against or abstentions, that's right. Um, delegate authority to the assistant direction for program, I beg your pardon, assistant director for program and project delivery to progress with the planning, procurement and delivery of the projects within the business case, subject to the business case approval by government. A show of hands on that please, councillors, team. And thank you, and against, and abstention. Thank you. Have you got all that, Becky? Thank you very much. We now move on to uh, item number 10, Councillor Morley. Um, I mean, bearing in mind what you said about a, a name vote, I don't mind my name being entered at the, in, in the minutes of saying that I, I think it's, uh, it, it, although it's welcome to have money into the town, I think it's taxpayers' money that can be used elsewhere rather than on this vanity type pro project for Kingsling by endorsed by Kingsland Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, we are not going to continue with discussion of this. The item is finished. We're going to move on to the Riverfront Development Plan, um, which is also an interesting. And, and to present that, I'm, thank you, David. Thank you for your attendance. Nice to see you back. Who is presenting this item? Uh, Matthew, I knew you would. Right, over to you then. Sir. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, it's actually a double act tonight. Um, I'll do the first few slides. I I'm either going deaf or you haven't turned your microphone. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a double act tonight. Um, I'm going to do the first few slides and then a gentleman called Peter Sharp from Mott McDonald um, will be joining in for um, you covering the business case development um, aspect of this. Um, so obviously this is the Riverside Regeneration Project as part of the Town Deal Fund. Um, it is quite different to what was originally put forward uh, in the original bid owing to various things such as changing the housing allocations in the local plan um, and risk issues identified with getting a kind of boat restaurant operator into the town. Um, so we had to kind of rethink things um, and so we've gone at pace with this following particularly a, a kind of interesting workshop that we held back in April, I think it was. And then we pulled together those ideas um, from, from that workshop and passed them over to Graham Massey Architects who were appointed uh, to act on our behalf in, in, in this matter. So going back a little bit, um, obviously historically the, the town revolved around the river, you know, for transport, et cetera, and business. Um, and historically it's turned us back a little bit on the, on, on, on the river. Um, and what we want to do is kind of revive, um, oh, sorry, the, is the presentation, can you see the presentation? Uh, sorry, would you mind sharing this? Sorry, I beg your pardon, I've just started talking. Okay, that's, that's lovely, thank you. Um, so obviously the, um, uh, lost my thread now. Um, 
yeah, so so we, we looked at trying to revive and uh, get some more activity onto the uh, the historic riverfront. And so what we've done is try to weave some ideas in with some already and emerging projects, uh, already existing projects, such as the pontoons and bringing forward the Summerfeld and Thomas uh, warehouse site at the southern end of the quay. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? So the elements that have been identified is um, one of the key areas for, for, for me anyway, personally, is uh, the Custom House. You know, it's uh, one of the most iconic buildings in, in, in West Norfolk. It's stood empty for a little while. And so what we want to do is um, bring that back into use. And there's been much discussion about it. So we, as part of the project team, we brought in um, some specialist consultants such as FEI and um, um, I can't remember the name of them, Creative Orchard Events. So some of the business activities, we put together a couple of options for the customs house. Um, and we've gone through a bit of a process consulting with people, and particularly local residents as well. Um, and then we've narrowed that down and refined it as we've gone forward. And um, in the business space, what we've actually put in, the business case, what we've actually put in is a more exhibition type facility for the custom house. And there may be a bit of ancillary food and drink offer just to help support the activities there. Now, obviously the building is on two stories. Um, and we've looked at physical adaptations to make it a more accessible building. Um, so what we're proposing to do is put a lift in there uh, to make the second and uh, first floors more accessible and possibly the first floor more of a flexible space that perhaps um, it can be used for events, et cetera, as well. The setting of the um, custom house is um, also very important, you know, so a greater understood building. And as part of the process we've gone through, we've obviously consulted with um, statutory bodies such as Historic England and some of the more um, out there ideas that we put together, Historic England didn't like. Um, so we've reshaped some of those and removed some of the um, proposals from the uh, Per Fleet and the body of water known as Per Fleet. However, our cabinet um, is quite interested in looking at those in greater detail. And they've asked us to come back again once we've had a relook at some of the uh, more out there ideas, such as a floating swimming pool, et cetera, uh, in that area. And one of the ideas on King State Square was also a covered market area. So we felt that that was a high risk issue uh, to try and fit within the town deal program timescale. So as I say, discussed it with cabinet and they've asked us to relook at that again, but it's gonna take a bit of time. We'll come back and see where we get with that. Okay, can you go into the next slide, please? Um, King State Square is another area identified. Um, at one stage, we had sort of parked that for a little while. However, there was a little bit of pushback on that because it is quite an important um, public realm area and there's already events uh, take place on there. So what it was felt was that it did need a bit of injection of cash and sort of slightly lifting it. Um, it is a high quality public realm area um, and um, it just needs a little bit of enhancement uh, just to sort of lift a little bit uh, for future events. So similarly to the public realm area around the body of water per fleet and here, um, what we're proposing to do is um, enhance it a little bit and put in some servicing so that we can hold events. So they're almost like a, a plug and play set up. So there'll be hopefully um, electrical points for uh, maybe some street food events or stalls or Christmas markets, etc., just to make it more practical uh, to, to set up events. Before we move on to the next bit, I forgot to mention that the events element of this is really quite important. So Kingsland does a really good, I think, um, series of events in the town, like Festival 2 and Hansa Festival and Heritage Open Day and this sort of thing. So what we're talking about is, is setting up these public realm areas to accommodate smaller events, that the, a, a smaller events program can be developed and fit in with a larger events program, so that there's more activity and interest throughout the year, all the way along the, 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 the key front. Um, sorry, can you move on to the next slide, please? Again, one of the key areas uh, that we've we looked at is the southern part of uh, the former grain silo site, uh, which is located between the historic way called Devil's Alley and the body of water called Millfleet. So that is a brownfield site that um, has been cleared, but looks fairly unpleasant at the moment. And 
we have looked at that site for potential development in the past, but we felt that there was a risk with the mill fleet in the proximity. Um, so what we've done is come up with an idea of an active public realm space that again can be used for uh, events. You know, so for example, uh, when there's the water ski championships on the river, uh, you could put on uh, food and drink um, and stalls, etc., to complement that. Um, again, infrastructure will be put in so that it can be, happen. And the proposal is to put a covered way around the southern and eastern edge of it that can act as a sort of a, a pleasant place to sit uh, for residents and uh, people who come to work in the town, don't have their lunch, but also the servicing for pop-up stalls could be located within there so that you can have uh, a perimeter uh, space that uh, provides things for people visiting that area. We're hoping that this area will complement the site to the north, which is the remainder of the, um, the former grain silo site and the Summerfeld and Tom's Warehouse site. So those sites aren't actually within the town deal bid, but this site is quite important in terms of making that site more attractive to investors and developers. And we are engaged with some people about that site at the moment. Uh, and that's why I was a little bit late coming to this meeting um, because we're just about to commence some works uh, next week on the site to de-risk it um, by uh, commencing demolition of the 1950s and 1960s portal frame structure at the back of the old Summerfeld and Thomas Warehouse site. So hopefully with the development of this public realm area, uh, green it up a bit, uh, create leave space so that various activities can happen on it. Um, and then we bring forward the Summerfeld and Thomas site and that'll be a, a comprehensive redevelopment of that area. One of the other areas that does need a little bit further work is what's called dry site facilities. Again, that's fitting in with something that's already been provided, and that's the pontoons on the River Grey Twos. The, the, the architect's drawing show it on the, on the southwestern corner or toilet of that area uh, on that bottom drawing. It's not necessarily where that's going to go. Uh, that was just an indication of what it could look like. Um, there are opportunities to either put it in a public realm area or indeed on the Sunfield and Thomas site. Um, there's a little building next to the Summerfeld and Thomas uh, warehouse that could be suitable and some design work has been done on that. Okay, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So um, connecting the areas, uh, one of the proposals is to put visual things such as banners and lighting along the way, and hopefully that'll draw people up and down um, the, the key front. Um, the thing I haven't also mentioned is the tower there. That, that has caused a bit of controversy. Um, and the idea around that was that, um, I don't know whether people noticed, I'm sure you have, because you guys have been in the town for a long time, but there is a bit of a tower theme architecturally along the key front. So um, Clifton House was probably the first one. Um, then there's the Kingsland Conservancy Board uh, tower. Um, some of that has been sort of replicated in, the, in some residential development to the north of uh, the Corn Exchange car park. And I think even the magistrates' courts, their service um, area is also replicating some of the, uh, the, the, the towers. So it was, uh, it's considered a sort of a feature that could be used as a tractor, uh, a viewing platform, and then there's some other ideas being banded around. Well, could you have climbing facilities on it or, or even on the outside, etc. Uh, as I say, we've got to go through the detailed planning process um, and what we've done in shaping these ideas is trying to de-risk it as we've gone on with and evolved the ideas. Um, so we've engaged with, I mentioned Historic Cumbrian previously, um, but we've also engaged with Norfolk County Council's Local Highways Authority, Kingsland Conservancy Board uh, and others. And um, say so what we've done is shape stuff that we think we can deliver that we think that um, we'll be able to get planning permission for. And obviously this is a really sensitive area, really high concentration of listed buildings, a um, lot of residential property, customs houses, a grade one listed building, um, but we're hoping um, that it will come together quite nicely. And as, as I mentioned, with other things that were already being put in place, such as the pontoons, and then we bring forward the redevelopment of the Sunfeld and Thomas and Grain Cellar site, evolve the events program and we've set out the public realm areas to accommodate uh, the, the smaller events program and then tied in with uh, other town deal uh, projects such as the rail to river uh, public realm improvements so we're kind of hoping that this will be the few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that will pull it all together 
Um, and I think we're moving on to uh, Peter's aspect next on the next slide. Thank you, Matty. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to take you through the five cases of the of the business case. So first, the, the strategic case, which, as I'm sure you're aware from the other presentations, is can we demonstrate a clear case for change? In the case of the Riverfront project, um, we think it demonstrates a quite a strong case for change. It responds to local engagement that has highlighted that town centre living has been negatively impacted by a lack of nighttime economy uh, and a lack of a, a lack of opportunities to engage in culture, arts, and music. It, it will also uh, help to re-establish the riverfront as a focal point for the town, which again has featured heavily uh, within some of the engagement. It also addresses low, low, low levels of footfall along South Quay and will encourage dwell time and uh, enhance sort of connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists along, along South Quay. Uh, and lastly, and, and importantly, from an economic perspective, it provides the opportunity to increase visitor numbers, but, but also in, increase the dwell time of, of existing visitors and potentially generate additional overnight stays within Kinslin um, as a result. Next slide, please. So this, this shows the project's uh, theory of change. Uh, you may not be able to read all of it, so uh, apologies for that, but it, it does demonstrate the strong rationale for the intervention from the Towns Fund and the match funding. Uh, all of this does link back to the Town Deal Board's read priorities, um, and it demonstrates quite a number of positive outputs and outcomes that will arise from the investment. Um, and as Matthew, Matthew mentioned, it is also helping to de-risk other future investments, such as um, at the Summerfield and Thomas site. Next slide, please. So the economic case is essentially to ask, it, does it represent value for money? So we've adopted quite a, conserv a conservative, apologies, approach uh, to look at the benefits of the investment. So the four areas that we focused on within this business case have been around the events program that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's around the fact that there's, an, there's a well-being benefit that can be applied to audience members attending different types of cultural and arts events. So, that, so we've, we've applied that to the forecast visit numbers from the events program provided by Creative Orchard. There's also been a small amount of direct job creation associated with the investments um, provided by FEI in, in their business plan. Um, and then there's also additional benefits associated with enhancement to the public realm uh, and the conservation benefit of investing and helping to safeguard the listed building of, of Custom House. So overall, the project shows a strong benefit cost ratio of 2.83 which represents high value for money. And as you can see in the table, it also provides a very strong net present social value. To test the assumptions within the economic case, we've applied a number of sensitivity tests. So the first of the sensitivities, um, we've applied an increased level of optimism bias. So uh, just as a quick explanation, um, project appraisers have a systemic tendency to overestimate the benefits or underestimate the costs of a proposal. So by applying optimism bias, it, it helps to ensure that what, what we are looking at is realistic. Now, in the preferred option, we've applied the government's recommended optimism bias for uh, capital expenditure on standard buildings. For the sensitivity test, we've then increased that to non-standard buildings to reflect the listed building. So we've applied a much higher level of optimism bias and, and that does bring the benefit cost ratio down, but it still represents high value for money. The second sensitivity test is that we've, we've uh, then said, well, based on FEI's projections, we'll, we'll assume that there'll be considerably less direct job creation as a result of, of the investment. As you can see, that has a relatively small effect on the benefit cost ratio, primarily because the direct job creation associated with the scheme uh, is, in the, is in the low tens. And then lastly, the third sensitivity test we've applied is to look at the events programme and the figures provided by Creative Orchard Events to say, well, actually, if the visitor numbers that are being forecast uh, are not realised for whatever reason, what would be the impact? So. Here we've halved the projected audience numbers. Uh, and even at that point, the benefit cost ratio still comes out at 1.77, 
which um, still represents acceptable value for money for government and is close to representing high value for money. Alongside those uh, economic benefits, there are a range of uh, other impacts that we would expect to see from the scheme but that have not yet been monetized. So these include um, indirect job creation. So that's uh, job creation with other on other sites and other businesses from the visitors that are coming to to visit these sites, spending in the wider local economy. Improved perceptions of place, but, but also there's potential for reduced crime and reduced antisocial behaviour as a result of the investment. So these things have not been monetised, but um, it theoretically is possible to apply value to them to, to increase the benefit cost ratio if needed. So on that basis, we're comfortable that this provides uh, or represents, I should say, high value for money. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, commercial case is is focused on is is the uh, project viable? Is there a supplier that can meet needs? Would would it be suitably attractive for suppliers? And does it fit with appropriate procurement guidelines? So, as you can see on this slide, the procurement strategy is to to follow the council's existing contract standing orders. Uh, and there's a number of procurement items that have been highlighted in, in the table on this slide. Uh, one I particularly wanted to mention here was the first one, that, that the need to appoint external project management to provide sufficient capacity to support council delivery. Uh, that, that was something that's been raised by officers, um, and but that has been built into the cost plan and is reflected in this procurement strategy. So, so that is a, a, a critical part. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, the fifth of the cases is the management case. Um, so is it achievable? Does the council have capacity to deliver these projects successfully? And are there robust structures in place to manage the project? Um, as you can see from here, there's quite a clear and detailed project management structure in place to deliver the project, which does include um, an allowance for external project management consultancy in here. And at the bottom, you can see a number of development and operational work streams all the way through to the evaluation and monitoring of the project outcomes that is required from the Towns Fund by the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Next slide, please. This, this uh, slide shows a high level project programme, which highlights that the project is achievable within the timeframe for the Towns Fund. Um, as you may, may be able to see, again, it is a little small, the construction period is due to be completed at the end of quarter one, 2025, 26. So that's around about the end of June, 25. Uh, this is considered prudent. It allows for scope for delays prior to the end of eligible town to spending in March of 2026. You'll also note that uh, like some of the other town to projects, this is at a relatively early stage uh, and the, the next step for the project to, to progress through uh, REBA stage two, stage three, uh, and the planning process. Next stage, uh, next slide, please. So, and then th finally, and even smaller, the uh, risk register. This is the headline risk register, register showing key risks. Um, just to pick out the, the ones that we piloted as, the, as the, the highest risk at this stage are as you'd expect, the financial risk around increase in material cost and construction costs. Uh, th that has been mitigated through the cost plan provided by quantity surveyors that have built in a risk contingency and also an allowance for tender price inflation. Um, and as Matthew said out at the start, start of this, this item, the programme is scalable to reflect some of the other uncertainties as they develop over potentially over the next couple of years. Um, at, other key risks that uh, uh, should be brought up, uh, just to mention, as, as Matthew mentioned about the early engagement with Historic England and other key stakeholders, that's a really important part of addressing the risk of failure to, to get planning consent or listed building consent. Equally, um, discussions that we're aware officers have had with the landowner of Custom House around potential changes to uh, lease arrangements and so on. So, um, I think that's the last slide, I believe. Yeah, th thank you. Fine, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions, so can I have a show of hands?
Thank you very much, yeah, Councillor Cunningham. Um, people who've heard me here before will know, I suppose, what I'm going to say. Support of you mentioning buses. This is something that we don't do. Reading this report, the word visitor is used a lot, and it ought to say tourist, not visitor, because that's what we need. We need people to dwell in this place more. And that, that, that it's not used. I see the word tourism here uh, to encourage tourism. Yeah, I agree. But, but the other thing that got me here is this. We are happy to accept the fact that money will be spent to provide some facilities for a couple of boats on the moorings. And, and it's in here. That's what we're going to do. That would cost the earth. But if we encourage tourism and encouraged bus companies to have a day in Kings Lynn, historic Kings Lynn and so forth, you need somewhere for them to park for the day. And this is an ideal opportunity. The cost of that would be minimal as regards to what you're going to spend on looking after people coming with the food boats. And a bus is likely to bring in 50 people. A boat might bring in half a dozen. And the facilities you're going to provide, no doubt, will be showers and toilets or whatever. It's, it's always to think about. But when you've got a boat on the Great Ooze, that's a seagull investment. They will have their facilities on that boat. Where I live, on the Well Creek, they won't. But they will in this here. And I believe we are missing a point. This is not mentioned at all. I would like to think, we would not made a start on this. I would like to think that it's looked at again and looked at how we can attract this area to tourists via excursions. And a lot of these companies do offer excursions all over. Recently, I looked a day in historic Stanford. It's an excursion, a company from Lincoln. But they don't do it in Kings Lynn. But they, and we do get buses, so people tell me a food bus has come in, but we drop the people off and tell them to go down, uh, I forget the lane now, where Kings Lynn IDB is, okay. but, but that, they then park up for the day and pick them up again. That's not user friendly at all. You need a facility for them to park and then walk around the town and whatever. And when we get on a talk on here, mention people uh, encourage people to spend and stay longer. That is the sort of facility we want to put on for this to happen. Spending money on enhancing the facilities for a couple of boats is not value for money. Providing an area for buses to park, and no more than say four or whatever, that could be controlled. And that would be a lot less costly and a lot more beneficial. I always just look at that because I feel very strongly that is something that we could do at this stage, but it's not mentioned in this report at all. Madam Chair, I'll leave that at the present. Um, Councillor De Wally. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start with the observation tower. How would the observation tower be operated in the interest of effectiveness, health and safety? Assuming that the tower is intended to provide a high level viewing point, then why is it at the very far end of the waterfront? Is it appropriate for a tower to be built in an essentially low rise historic waterfront? Has the impact upon the privacy and house values of neighboring properties been adequately assessed? And can assurances be given that it's not likely to become a liability with the increasing risk of tidal surges due to climate change and sea level rise? And forgive me, um, you will have to bear with me on this one. If the intention is to drive up visitor numbers to Kings Lynn and to the historic waterfront in particular, there is one proven approach which can be observed in historic seafronts around the country, and that is to have a permanent appropriate exhibition ship. These are magnets for visitors. Um, it, is, it is important that such a vessel has associations with the setting and local heritage. In the case of the Purfleet and Kings Lynn, a Hansacog, although none are currently available to my knowledge, would be most appropriate. However, traditional Thames barges traded frequently with Kings Lynn, and there was a choice of two available at the moment, each at a guide price of just under £200,000. These vessels are flat bottomed with an unladen, very shallow draft, and are eminently suitable for the shallow, enclosed waters of the Purfleet. 
The Perth fleet itself is an ideal facility as it can be used as required as a dry dock for inspection and maintenance purposes. The original riverfront development that created the impounded Perth fleet contained just such an exhibition vessel in the architect's drawings. The recent waterfront vision showed an inland waters narrowboat in Perth fleet. Forgive me, this is as inappropriate as a floating swimming pool in Perth fleet. Would you not agree that the Perth fleet cries out for an appropriate exhibition vessel? Thank you, Chair. Um, did you want to respond to that, Matthew? Uh, I wouldn't mind because um, there's been quite a few comments and I'll forget them. I mean, so I, shall I, can, can yeah, I try and absolutely. run my way back through some of them? I think some other members want to ask yeah. some questions, but if we go on too much further, I'm not, not going to remember what all the questions were. So, okay, um, starting with the boat. Um, Yes, you're correct. Um, it is um, something that um, was in some of the kind of design boards or, or vision boards, whatever, from the architect. Um, back in the day, there was originally an idea to have a floating restaurant, um, but there was a risk there associated with the very few operators who were actually interested. Now, sorry, I'm no expert in some of these tourism exhibition activity things, but I think there's two different type of boats. There's a boat that's of scale, there's of historical interest, there's a visitor attraction. Um, that you will have people come to visit and go around and then there's something that is a bit of a decorative feature in the, in the body of water in that location. Mm -hmm. Now my understanding is and we will follow this through because we parked the floating pool bit because that was a bit contentious with the Sorry Kingdom particularly because the setting of the grade one listed building. Matthew could you put your microphone on please? It, it is. It is. is, on, it? It is on, yeah. okay. You're not hearing me. Okay right. Well, move it. Can you hear me now? Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, the call is better, yeah. Um, so I don't know if you heard me. I think there's two different type of boats and all that sort of thing. Um, and um, as I say, we, we parked the, um, the, the, the floating pool element because there's a little bit out there, particularly for Historic England. But as, as I said previously, uh, uh, cabinet members were keen that we did look at doing something uh, with the per fleet uh, and I think as previously mentioned in some of the other presentations we've been we have to operate within a certain budget envelope um, so the stuff that we put together in the presentation the business case we can do all that within the town deal money that uh, is available to us um, but um, cabinet uh, members did say have a look at it uh, the per fleet and do delivering some of these other things and also find a way of paying for it um, very straightforward I'm sure um, so um, the other thing was um, uh, the observation tower and you mentioned I think health and safety and how do you operate it etc that's a good question we don't know at the moment um, but that will be looked at as part of the next process um, I mentioned planning risk because obviously there's a high concentration of listed buildings in two different conservation areas and um, some of the planning stuff might be a bit tricky. So I'm not too sure whether we'll get the, the, the tower through the planning process, um, but we will look at how that is managed and operated. So there could be a couple of options. It's generally open uh, and people can go up and down it as they please, but then you have to put safety features around it to make sure nobody throws themselves off the top or, or falls out accidentally, or it becomes more of a commercial activity that fits in with some of the activities on the key front. So, then it's not open to the public all the time. And then when you've got an event on or, or, or uh, um, the water ski championships, you then open it up, staff it, and it's uh, you control it that way. So there's various different ways we can look at that one. Um, house valuations, that's again, it's another interesting one. Um, because obviously previously on that site, there was five, six story Brady bins from the old grain silo site. So during the course of the history of the, the silo sites, you know, um, I started looking at, at it back in 2003 um, and uh, previous owners have subsequently demolished the structures on there. Uh, and obviously there was quite a significant structure actually on the quay. Um, I don't know if you, there's some pictures that we can send through, but you know, there used to be the big Brady bins and then it spanned across the quay and then there's a big sort of tower. And that, as I said, when I was speaking earlier, you know, that, that tower is replicating stuff that like goes on elsewhere, you've all the key architecturally. Um, has that have I picked up your questions? Well, whilst you're having a look, um, Councillor Crofts, I wasn't asked to look at buses. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you said, um, but obviously I was asked to look at the, um, the waterfront. Uh, and, and that's not really a kind of area for coaches, uh, although hopefully 
when coaches arrive, people filter down there and take part in or in events and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, just to just clarify that point. Matthew, uh, could I ask, um, probably I'm not hearing very well, I, I also had exhibition ship bang on my list and I, was that an absolute no? I mean, why not? Because it would seem the perfect thing to put in the perfect, it almost like a no brainer. Yeah. I know it doesn't have to be a restaurant, just an exhibition ship, something for kids to go around. I've been going on about this for bloody years, actually. Yeah. But um, uh, was that a complete no? It, it's, it's not a complete no. Um, as I say, we, because we've had to change direction on the riverfront regeneration thing because of various things from what has had to happen since the original bid was put in, this has been done at pace. Um, so we did actually look at a boat and, and looked on the internet for some sort of boat that you could actually stick on there as, a, as something as a, a tourist attraction. And it was very expensive. Um, I know um, Councillor Wally's mentioned a couple of hundred thousand pounds, but the ones I looked at, there were way, way more than that. And then you've got the management and the maintenance and all that sort of thing about it. Um, as I say, the, the Perfleet body of water has been parked a little bit and we will be looking at it again. Um, so it's not necessarily wholly ruled out, it's just that we can't afford it within the, the budget envelope of the town deal money. Um, so, um, and this is one of the other things that came through the, the, the iterative process we've been going through with developing these ideas is that the floating restaurant's a good idea, um, but we couldn't get anybody interested to come. Therefore, if you improve the surrounds and have more activity there with the customs house, it might make it more pro uh, attractive proposition. So somebody might subsequently want to bring a boat. So we'll, as I say, we'll look at it again and hopefully hopefully, once everybody's in agreement that we improve the, the area, um, and then we'll go through the process of looking at the using the, the water. If I, uh, sorry, Councillor Diwali, I don't want to steal your shoes, but I don't think anybody's suggesting floating restaurants. I think what we were talking about is an exhibition ship, something that uh, youngsters could enjoy looking around and get some sort of experience from. And I believe when I proposed this several years ago, that if we could maybe get some link up with other hands uh, um, locations to actually park fund it. I think we do need to look at this holistically and also present something which alongside the customs house really looks exciting. Uh, certainly not a swimming pool or a park bench, but that's just my view. Anyway, I, I have a lot of other people who want to speak. Uh, Councillor Morley. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, I think this is a great project, and uh, I just make the observation before I before I add a few things is that um, I mean I think it's pretty realistic. This is a, a benefit cost ratio of two point three. Uh, the uh, the much of the community uh, was two point two two point four, uh, and the active travel was three point four four. So I think that in itself is an indicator of realism about uh, what, what, what should be done and what could be needed. And I think this is desperately needed. Can I just answer, I'll just make another detour, is that we had a tourism presentation uh, recently and not one thing about parking was mentioned, which is obviously a strategic issue in terms of tourism, which I, was, I, thought, was, I thought was uh, a weakness in the presentation. And I, th and I think we, we've discussed this, Chair, mm -hmm. and that uh, that would be one thing that should go to the top of this agenda, of this panel, is actually kick-starting that debate and trying to get something done about, about parking for tourism. Uh, I go back, I don't want to do a nickel and dime the design. I mean, I like towers. Uh, I've been at the Clifton Tower. People are like, you know, everybody knows, you know, BT Tower is always a big draw, the Shard's a big draw, and, and you get a much better perspective of the area. And I think that those sort of things, as long as we can, as long as we get going and we future proof design changes or design additions, the sooner this thing gets gets going, the better, really. And what I, what I fear is that, you know, people go, oh, why don't we do this? Why can't we do that? Why can't, you know, why do we need banners? I don't know why we need banners, but still. The, uh, um, just, let, just let's get the thing on, on the road. That's what I would say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Have you thought for towers something like a Lord of the Rings Eye of Sauron tower? 
I, I think somebody had actually mentioned that at the uh, consultation event we did with the uh, the, the residents. Um, but uh, as, as I say, the, the, these are these are design ideas. We've got to go to the detailed design, and we we can shape things. But I mean, one thing that I think would be good um, from a tourist point of view is something similar to the Hunstanton live webcams that sit on the. So if you had one in the tower. That would be quite a good feature to look down along the waterfront um, that was available publicly. Also little periscopes for children to look through so they could turn them and see down the river front. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in? I, I just said that, you know, um, we've got some sort of preliminary ideas and designs. We will be refining this as we go. So we will be back, you know, we, we will come back to R&D because this will be shaped and it will morph and, and evolve as we go through the, 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 the more detailed design process. And kind of the stuff that you just mentioned there, I think is a great idea personally, you know, so um, I'd love to be able to come back and, you know, get some help really from the, the R&D panel with helping shape these ideas. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Chair. Matthew, did you say about, did I misunderstand you, forgive me, did you say about putting a lift in the custom house? No. Uh, have, have you actually asked a lift manufacturer, have you taken them around and asked them what they think? Uh, we haven't actually asked a lift manufacturer, um, but um, the, the architect who worked on this has worked on historic buildings, um, and we discussed it with Historic England, and um, they were very keen actually because they um, I thought they might rail against it to be honest um, because it is quite a dramatic change and it doesn't have to be a six person passenger lift it can be a, a one and a half person platform lift As, and they, they were quite keen because they're wanting more significantly listed buildings to be more accessible to a wider range of the public uh, and obviously wending your way upstairs and historic buildings can be quite difficult with people with mobility issues um and uh, so so they were really quite quite positive about it um i don't want to go into the detail too much because we're in open session um but um the, the architect um put together some ideas and uh, I, I, I presume mostly in the customs house but there's a storage area which closes off some of the uh, the floor area on the ground floor and then there's some toilets and there was talk about putting the toilets actually on the second floor because it's not that usable. And then if you had the, the, the lift column all the way up, you know, people would be able to access the toilets, then it would clear the ground floor space for more exhibition or whatever you wanted to do. Um, and there are areas of the building that can accommodate a, a small lift. Um, and the, the discussions that we've had were it's designed that somebody with a, a wheelchair and somebody pushing a wheelchair could get into it. It's that sort of size. So it's not a big one. It would be a relatively small one to take a chair and a person. Yeah, I mentioned that because I've done it as two in listed buildings and uh, it can be quite challenging. But it's, you know, I know everybody says they've done it, but every old building is different. Anyway, I won't dwell on that one. I'm glad to know that you've done some research. I think, thanks. Um, quickly, uh, you, you realize that Kingsday Square across its park is flood defense and there is electricity in a cabinet there for, for use. Um, and uh, that the square, a great, great, a large area of it actually is um, cellars. So the amount of soil that you can dig up and put electricity um, um, ducting under is, is quite limited. So you need quite a bit of research on that one. Um, with regards to the tower, I mean, has anybody said how high they want this to be? Because I can see, I mean, personally, I think that's bonkers. I'll be quite honest with you. I think the idea of perhaps putting it in near the middle of the town might be better, um, but uh, you know it's it's one of those things, and I, I, you know, getting people up there, getting people down, and so on and so forth. You know, it, it maybe if it was a big big wheel like the you know in, in London, that something like that, you've got people can hop on and off at the bottom, so you've got some capacity. But uh, the tower, mm. the king's of mine. Um, but one thing that is needed, and I keep mentioning it, and Dunk will be sick of here, is the pontoons. I agree it's totally with Chris Cross about um, coaches coming in, but the pontoons are not finished yet because they haven't got a facility 
for people visiting to come here. They haven't got a chart room, they haven't got laundry facilities. And there is a building nearby which can be converted to that. And we've talked about this before, and I hope that it's on somebody's radar somewhere, because if not, the pontoon's a bit, um, I don't know. It, it's like a half a project, you know, it's, because if you had the, the, you know, chart room and facilities there, when they had water ski events and other events on the quay, the borough council can use it as well for a point of contact. So that, that would work. And the, the restaurants can perhaps contribute looking after it. Um, the only other thing, I, I, I just think there's lots of things. I think the idea of the boat in the Pearl Fleet is a good one. And it's, it's, um, Councillor de Wally is quite right. It also doubles as a dry dock, which is something which has never been looked at. But um, I, I think there are, um, as we say, there are possibilities on the key. I just think that they want to be pulled together so that they're usable. Um, and the other thing is, um, of course, at the far end, of course, near the mill fleet, some of the conditions of the sheet piling wants inspecting. Um, so it should be part of the project. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chair, do you want me to comment? Shall I comment on what Councillor Guinness has said? Um, if I, again, working backwards, the sheet piling at the southern end, um, you know, we flagged that with the Environment Agency, and they're having a look at that. Um, the, um, uh, you mentioned um, the sellers in King's Day Square. That was one of the other big issues that came out of the various consultations that we did, um, was the why that the key is constructed and the, pro the presence of all these old sellers um, underground, obviously. Um, because obviously there was, there was talk about doing a lot more greening and planting. So when we mentioned that, there was a bit of scoffing and well, your trees will just drop through because there's, there's voids everywhere. Um, and then when we talked about putting planters and things like that, the environment agency said, we don't want these being washed up against the tidal defences and bre breaching it and flooding uh, uh, Kings Lee. And that's why a lot of the designs don't have that much greening about them. Um, apart from the, the bit down at the bottom near the mill fleet, because that's actually behind the defences and, um, and we're in control of that. And so we own that site so we can um, green that up a bit more. Um, I, the other thing that um, was quite um, um, important was that a lot of the comments from the workshop and other people was about the, the, the traffic up and down the key front and across King State Square. King State Square. Um, a lot of people kind of wanted that through route to stop. Um, when we looked at it, it was, it was apparent that if we tried to do that, there would, there would be a, an adverse knock on effect to the local highway network and potentially push traffic around the town through the Tuesday marketplace and down King Street, which wasn't ideal. So when we were talking with the county council, they, they kind of liked the ideas of us evolving this, this more uh, events program um, along the quay in King Stay Square um, because they were saying that, well, you'll do more temporary traffic closures um, and that would give them the opportunity to collect data about what the impact in as a local highway network from these closures um, and then they'd monitor it uh, going forward. Um, so that's not necessarily out of, the, out of the equation at this point. It just needs a bit more information and our events programme might drive that information. Um, yeah, I think I picked up points there. Thank you. Councillor Crofts. Uh, just a point of information, Madam Chairman, I've looked around, I'm the only one who was on the planning committee at the time, but there was a restaurant that was given permission and that was about seven years ago. I remember it quite well and it went before the committee. It wasn't handled by officers and it was a long debate too, but it was given permission, but it never ever happened. That's just that information I thought I'd let you know. Thank, thank you. Can I come in quickly? Yes. One of the problems of having a water a restaurant in an area like that, of course, with a boat you restricted to size because of the per fleet, its physical dimensions, but also connection to services like sewerage, which is quite important, and kitchen and water supply and that sort of thing. And how long before the boat starts looking like an octopus with pipes going everywhere and that sort of thing. It, mm. It's setting, but um, the exhibition boat, of course, doesn't need all that. Mm. Thanks. I do. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for input. I, I personally think there's still work to be done on this, but I like the idea of the green space. I don't think we have nearly enough 
uh, public green space in Kings Lynn. Um, I'm not a fan of the tower, but hey, you know, that's just my view. Uh, the temporary uh, event space, we did discuss it about the noise. We have to be mindful of residents. People do live there. It, it is their home. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how you're going to square that circle. Um, I, I would not like to see coaches parked on the quayside. But on the other hand, I cannot help but agree with my fellow councillors that to pump a lot of money into the pontoon without well, uh, for how many people it is, is also a challenge. So I think, I think we need to encapsulate those concerns, those ideas, those comments into um, the recommendations to Cabinet. So um, I am asked to consider the report and make appropriate recommendations, which I hope we can capture, Becky, if that's all right. Um, and then to support the recommendation to Cabinet as set out below. Here we go again. Endorse the draft business case as set out in Appendix 1 in order to secure town deal funding. Do I have your agreement, panel? Agreed. Thank you. Approve the use of the council's assets and property interests for the purposes of the project as set out in the business case. Do I have your agreement, panel? Thank you. Delegate authority to the chief executive, the deputy leader, and the portfolio holder for development and regeneration to approve the final business case in their capacity as council representatives on the town deal board. Do I have your agreement, panel? Great, right, thank you. Delegate authority to the section 151 officer to approve the final business case and sign the business case summary document for submission to government in the council's capacity as accountable body for the town deal. Do I have your agreement, panel? Request that a report is brought to a future cabinet meeting setting out the due diligence and option appraisals to approve the operating model and business planning for the project. Do I have your agreement? That's right. The remaining riverfront proposals not included in this project, as set out within this report, para 2.9, should remain priority projects to be pursued by the Borough Council outside of the town deal programme. Do I have your agreement, Pal? Thank you very much. I'd now like to move forward to the work program and forward decisions list. And um, we, uh, we, you will be aware, panel members, that we had to postpone our meeting of the 13th of September, which has meant that the tourism um, report and its wider implications, including Councillor Morley car parking, which I think is all part of the whole, has been deferred. I have had some conversation with Becky about trying to slot in another meeting. Our next meeting is the 8th of November, and then our subsequent meeting is January. We have looked at October, which is presenting a few problems. And I wondered if I had your agreement to try and slot something in in December, how you felt about that. Can I have your views? Because we could we could dedicate that to talking about tourism, to talking about car parking. And I don't want it to slip, she said, banging her pen. I don't want it to slip too far into the new year. Otherwise we're back in the tourist season and the whole thing just comes back again. So can we look at that with your approval? Yes. Thank you so much. Does anybody have anything else they want to say about the forward, the work program and forward decisions at this point in time? I think we have quite enough on up. Councillor Humphrey. I'm sure the tourism debate will include Councillor Cross's point about coaches. Oh, uh, the whole line, yeah, and and motorhomes and 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 motorhomes as well, because that has become. If you remember, there were two issues at cabinet: uh, tourist tax and motorhome parking, which were deferred to this panel. And we need to talk about those um, and really do our breakouts and get kind of a lot of ideas going around that. So I'm really keen on that. I will not forget the coaches, Councillor. As I recall, um, at the previous meeting, it was decided that we should contact some of the coaches that do excursions yeah. to yeah. find out what they want. Yeah. And that could be very useful to come to that meeting in, in December. Yeah, I think we have to be very careful that we're not doing officers' work for the Councillor Humphrey. But nevertheless, I agree. <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting that members do it. I mean, <laughs> officers have the facilities, knowledge and contacts. Uh, absolutely. I think more of direct outside reporting coming into this panel from people who know what they're talking about would be absolutely excellent, including a representative of, there must be some sort of motorhome um, 
overarching body. And I think we really do need to hear from them because I, I remain strongly of the view that Councillor Bubb's proposal all those panels ago has got real merit and it keeps coming back to us. We must not let that one go. So thank you. Yeah, I, 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 very exciting. The date of the next meeting will be the 8th of November, 2022 at 4.30 in the town hall and thank you for a very lively and participative meeting if that's um, a word and i therefore declare the meeting closed at 1854 thank you oh councillor blunt has gone thank you.